and then this love, I can't even talk about it six years later, that was, I have no words. But someone asked me later on, they said, where did you go? And I said, into the gaps. <laughs> and they said, which gaps? And I said, all of them. You know, being alive is the most magical experience possible, but to be alive and to be in love at the same time is immeasurably beautiful. You know, I, I'm not going to lie, there was a period there afterwards where I was going, I want to go back to that. Good evening and welcome to Earth to the Other Side. My name is John Glasspool and I'm your host. And tonight I am speaking with Mark Waller and he is a professional artist. And back in 2016, he had three NDEs, which he's going to uh, discuss with us tonight. Mark, thank you so much for being on the channel. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. So uh, let's get started. I'm really anxious to hear about your story and your experience. So uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Um, okay. So I, I was, I had three experiences. Uh, one sort of, I'm going to call it the big one, which was in, in the middle of a brain surgery. And then one that was prior to the brain surgery and another one that was after the brain surgery. So I collapsed. I was taken to hospital in an ambulance and scanned. And I had a lovely Irish doctor say to me, you seem like a straight shooter, so I'm going to give this to you right between the eyes. You have a mass in your brain and lesions in your lungs, but try not to worry. It might not be cancer. <laughs> and I had probably 24 hours, probably a bit longer, of abject horror and terror. Um, I'd had a melanoma cut out of my shoulder three years before and I'd been living in fear of that. And so that was a culmination of all of those nightmares at once. And I had the night after I'd collapsed, I'd got to a point where I was completely exhausted. And in a way, it was a death without dying. So I remember lying there in the bed and, 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 and thinking, um, I can't fight this this is bigger than me I can't do anything and I I surrendered I, I surrendered completely and utterly and I remembered my brain saying something or this voice saying something and pardon the French but this is as it came out I'm not sure how we are with uh, <laughs> bleeping things out but basically the voice said um you're royally bleeped um I guess we don't need Mark anymore. And I wanted to know who we was, firstly, and I think I know that now. Um, but I also realised in that moment that if I could put Mark down, then I've always been able to put Mark down. And I believe that that, that realisation, that, discovery was what allowed the actual experience to happen. That, that's my feeling. I feel a little bit like as though the fir that first thing was an introduction to, let's just say God, because I had this indescribably profound sense of peace in that moment and overwhelming love and being... I want to say cradled in the arms of something, but that's not right. You know, obviously with this sort of thing, it's so difficult finding words to articulate the experience because it's so far beyond any human experience. But I felt that everything had been prepared. That's probably the best way I could come up with it. I was prepared or something. And then I, the next day I woke up not without fear completely, but very calm, very relaxed. But because the tumour was the size of a peach and even though I'd had medications to reduce it, I was still behaving strangely and 
you know, saying, and there were things that I was saying, you know, everything's made of love. It's all love. Everything's made of love. I can see love in the walls. And everyone just thought that that was the brain surgery. And it may, you know, the, sorry, the tumour. And it may well have been, you know, but if it was, sign me up. I'll have another one. <laughs> but, um, and then I actually had the brain surgery a couple of days later, and that was on the Monday. So I collapsed on the Thursday night and had the brain surgery on the sat on the Monday. And the only thing I can, I had with the brain surgery, I remember clearly going out. I remember that. And then, and I will probably almost certainly burst into tears at some point trying to relay this. Um, but I remembered being aware of like a white fizz, almost like being completely surrounded by milk that was aerated. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Warm milk. And I got this sort of sense of um, endlessness. And then this love, I can't even talk about it six years later, that was... I have no words. But someone asked me later on, they said, where did you go? And I said, into the gaps. <laughs> and they said, which gaps? And I said, all of them. And by that, and it made no sense to them, but it was gaps between the stars, gaps between atoms, gaps between everything. And that surgery was six hours but I was gone for long enough to see stars being born, atoms being created, universes being shaped. And I was absorbed into everything. And one of the greatest frustrations about the whole experience is not being able to speak about it <laughs> and give other people a sense of it. Yeah. And, you know, like speaking about it, I can feel that those sensations and I can feel the timelessness and the endlessness of it all, but I can't speak about it. Mm. Yeah. And I would love nothing better than to share that experience with everyone I love, everyone actually. Mm. Well, Mark, it's going out there. So, you know, they may find it and uh, hopefully it resonates with them. You know, interestingly enough, in that space where I said I saw universes, I was having a dialogue with something at the same time. And that didn't, that makes it, it sounds like saying having a dialogue with something made it sound like it was separate. But it wasn't somehow. I was a part of it. Mm -hmm. but there were the, these words kind of appeared and they were, it was almost like they were written in white light, but they were felt and heard and seen all at once in ways I can't begin to explain. But one of the things that it said was, this is not your time. And I'm bringing this up for a reason um, because, and then the next thing it's, and I, 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 I remembered clearly thinking why me? And it just, there was one word. It said communicator. And I knew that that meant in paintings and actions. And these words came to me. I call them the two commandments. I say there's three commandments, but it's handy to only have three commandments when you've had a brain injury. It's not much to remember. It's good. Um, but there's only two commandments, really, and they are to play and give light. Give That's light? It. Give light. Mm -hmm. You know, time, space, love, care, yeah. compassion, kindness, to the best of your ability. That's it. I've since learned that mastery of life is play, give light, and get paid to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, right. yeah, that play and give light and that communicator thing 
felt like contracts, the right word, but that was, and not even conditional, but that's why I'm here still because the world needs light. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that people who have had NDEs and those spiritual experiences, the numbers of those people are, are increasing. They're getting bigger and that this is our ultimate evolution and that we will all um, discover the light, for want of a better term, or realise the light. Some of us it might take to die to do it and others of us may realise it while we're still alive in these human forms. But it's inevitable. We can only slow it down. We can't stop it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened next? So I, I had friends with me um, and they were saying, you can't come here. And I've had a lot of martial arts experience and they were firing these balls of white light at me and saying, block this karate man and laughing. If you knew these people, they'd actually died not long before me from cancer. And they were going, you can't, this isn't your time. You can't come here. You're, you're not ready to come here yet or something along those lines and laughing. And, and I remember there was no sense of me particularly in a strong way, if that makes any sense. It's just this vague idea of a vague memory of me or something, but separated. Yeah, it wasn't personal. It wasn't mm -hmm. it's a separation. It was universal. Yeah. And I remember coming out of the surgery and, well, that, that shocked my family, let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> because they, they thought I was insane because I came out of the surgery talking about um, seeing the world as connected energy rather than as individuals. And it, it was almost like there's this thin veneer over this 3D world and, and, and even objects that appear to be separated, you know, birds and people on the other side of the planet and unconnected, but somehow there was this filament of 3D through which this energy was all connected and that everything was connected yeah. and that that connection was Love is the best way I can say it, but I could see it. And then when I came out, you know, the truly interesting thing, and it's still this way now, but much less so, um, I could see through people, if that makes any sense at all, because I, I could see light being exchanged between people, especially when someone was kind. There was this, these orbs of light being exchanged. and. Still to this day, I can see kindness from about 300 miles away. I can spot someone who's kind. I can, I, you know, and straight away you can, you can tell. And, you know, I, I still am able to see when people are scared or, you know, I can see what's kind of, I can see things that I couldn't see before. Yeah. And I, I'm not quite sure what that's about or why, but I, I somehow up in that surgery People became transparent. <laughs> I don't know what that, how do we even how to explain that, but your intuition blossomed, you know, became more yeah. intensified. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've actually spent a lot of time since the surgery with people who are in the final stages of cancer or early stages of cancer or ill for whatever reason. And I've actually found that I've been reasonably useful in those areas so then i i actually had and so i had these three experiences the first one i believe was an introduction mm -hmm. the second one was everything lay bare and then the third one was this is how you can communicate it with the world because to come straight out of brain surgery and go, everything's connected. I can see the light between. I'm going to get locked up pretty quickly, you know. <laughs> and the best way that I can, I believe now, 
after having done a lot of meditation and a lot of reading, I believe that we are all that all the time. The only thing that stops us from realizing that is the belief in the personal identity. Mm. And that belief in the personal identity is the veil and the belief that we are bodies in a 3D experience is the veil that prevents us from experiencing truth, for want of a better term. And so it makes sense to me that the gateway through that has to be for people experiencing um, experiencing experience as a human, the gateway has to appear to be 3D as well. Does that make sense? It has to be something they can access Mm -hmm. because to expect, you know, beings that are attached to physicality to all of a sudden drop that and become spiritual is probably a bit of a leap. But um, so anyway, yes, so the third experience was quite bizarre and I can't really, um, I I should say that all of this, I've been over this a million times and I was full of painkillers and steroids and all sorts of stuff. So it would be really easy to discount that, the whole experiences. And at the same time, they are sharper and clearer than anything I've ever had, you know. And and there are truths in there that have come out of a tumour and drug-addled brain that make more sense than any of the stuff I said before I had the brain tumour, you know. So um, the third experience was a very strange one. It was a couple of days after the surgery and I had a, um, I hadn't had a shower and there was this Indian uh, nurse, and there's a whole story associated with him, but he was, I'm not sure that he was actually human. I feel like he was a guide somehow. Um, but anyway, he told me during the night, he said, tomorrow you're going to have a shower? And he said to me, it will be the greatest shower you've ever had in your life. <laughs> and um, so the next day I'd been put in a room and I was really close to the bath room but even then after the brain surgery I was really unsteady on my feet you know so I was looking at that doorway going well this is interesting I've never had to think about making six steps before and I did but I I put my foot on the ground and I I had never felt the ground beneath my feet like that before I felt the fabric on my clothes I we taped a plastic bag to my head to stop the water getting on the wound. And it was the most exquisite sensation I've ever had in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I sat in this plastic chair in this tiny little hospital or in this hospital room holding onto these handrails and turned on the shower. And uh, honestly, it was like the first time I'd had a shower in my entire life. There were holes in the chair and I managed to set myself up in a way so that I plugged up the holes. So I'm sitting in this little puddle (laughs) and water's pouring down all over me. And I remembered looking at the handrails, that hand things, and there were these glistening drops of water running down them. And I'm thinking, wow, that's so beautiful. And then I I looked at the handrails and I went, and just this word, these words, they came from the stars. And the second I sort of said that, I became indescribably conscious of the fact that those handrails were atoms forged in the heart of stars and reassembled into this handrail and that there was eons of space between them and they appeared solid and and I'm sitting in this chair looking at everything in the room and I realised that there was nothing in that room that hadn't been forged in the heart of stars. And at that point, and again, this is a point at which I'll probably become emotional again, it truly felt as though the room fell away. And I felt that I was... (laughs) sitting in a plastic chair with a plastic bag taped to my head, falling through the stars, falling through the cosmos, just tumbling, you know. And there was that feeling of being that love again and that spaciousness and 
being cradled and safe and yet falling through the stars. I still can't look at the starry night sky without losing my crap six years later. Um, and <clears throat> I remembered looking and, looking and going, everything's made of stars, everything's made of stars. And then I heard my brain ask this question or this voice and it changed everything. And the voice said, where did the voice come from? And in the instant that that happened, all of the stars started to sort of swell to the point where I was sitting in this chair again. Well, in fact, the chair had disappeared. Everything disappeared. I was just endless divine loving white light. And I don't know how long I stayed like that for. But I'm guessing the hospital has a lot of hot water. <laughs> but I came out of that shower and dried myself. And I somehow knew that that voice was, I'm going to use the word consciousness because that's the closest thing that I can come and that there is nothing that isn't consciousness. I realized that consciousness is endless. So if it's endless, it must be beginningless, which must means it must be eternal. And that love is also those things. So consciousness and love must be the same thing in my head, <clears throat> possibly in reality. But I came out of that shower and my Indian doctor came up to me and he looked me in the eye and he said, with this smile, this radiant smile, and he said, how was your shower? <laughs> I couldn't speak. And he just put his hand on my arm and said, I know. 20 years ago, he'd had a near-death experience. <laughs> he was 70, working late shift in the hospital. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I can't stop thinking of the uh, the way you describe the um, connectedness of everything. And I can't stop thinking of it. that web, the way you described it was so perfect. <laughs> it's such it's, a great way of describing it. That's exactly how I think it is. Like we're just all completely one, really. Yes. You know, yeah. and describing that is not necessarily complicated. It's like you said, it's love. Yeah, and, you know, it's really interesting. So for me, and this is something, so because I have a brain injury, <clears throat> I've, lost, I've lost a certain amount of hard drive. So in certain circumstances, my brain becomes overwhelmed. Now, what I've learned to do is I've learned to be able to turn off the biggest app that I have running, and that's called Mark. Because that app is the space from which all of the apps operate and it's the space from which I judge and assess the 3D experience. And so rather than trying to stop judgment, I just turn Mark off. And the truly interesting thing is, is that when I do that, um, the when I do do that, it's, it becomes indescribably peaceful. But this, the, the, the most incredible thing is, is that, that immediately that that peace is realised, that love's there again. It's right there. And, you know, we can't truly have love until we're at peace. And most of us never have peace. I, I spent two years in the chemo ward and I have a very strange sense of humour now and I find it almost laugh out loud funny that we say rest in peace. We don't live in peace, you know. One of the greatest things we could possibly do is to live in peace, to actually be at peace while we're alive. It's exquisite. And, and the, I, I feel like 
you know, being alive is the most magical experience possible, but to be alive and to be in love at the same time is immeasurably beautiful. You know, I, I'm not going to lie, there was a period there afterwards where I was going, I want to go back to that. But now I feel like I have the best of both worlds because I can still, I can have that and I can still have 3D experience and I can still be with my children and I can enjoy the gift of physicality and I get to enjoy yelling at people at roundabouts and stuff like that when they cut me off. All that fun stuff, you know? (laughs) So you can do this without dying, you know? You can, and I I highly suggest that uh, that's the route, you know, people go. And as much as I love brain surgery and the collapse and all of the trauma around that, it would have been nicer to do it without it, you know? (laughs) Seriously, eh? (laughs) Mark, before your near-death experience, uh, I'm just curious, were you uh, interested in these gaps and the stars and atoms and... No, no. Not at all? No, no. Look, you know, I, I read... A friend of mine had a book, I think it's Stephen Hawking's Theory About Everything. Mm. I read like five lines and went, oh, not reading that, you know. And look, occasionally I'd watch Cosmos or something on TV and go, wow, that's amazing, and then go back to my life. I guess the, the 3D experience is so jarringly loud that sometimes we, we, we get pulled away from thinking, letting our consciousness expand in too many ways, you know, so... Not really. I just went about my life. You know, I did my karate. I went surfing. I was, I was having a good life. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad. Married, kids, you know, nice little house. I was quite comfortable, you know. Yeah. All the usual things that annoy people kind of thing. So it wasn't, I was just a normal Aussie bloke, really, except I painted for a living instead of banged nails in the wood, you know, pretty much. And most of my mates are tradies, so our my dialogue and my life is kind of what was in that world, you know? So I was just a little bit weird because I was an artist, but other than that, you know, how has all of this affected your life since your near death experience? What's changed in terms of how you live now? Well, look, you know, that's, that's a really interesting thing. So I had a two year long, um, journey with cancer, you know, chemo, ward, radiation, all the usual stuff. And something really, really interesting happened. So for most of that time, I was utterly and completely at peace. And I found people being drawn to me because I was able to say things that were quite wise and intelligent at the time, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I was very, very calm and I had absolutely no fear of death, like absolutely no fear of death. And it doesn't sound like a big thing when you say it like that, but we don't realise just how much the fear of death permeates our life until you don't have it. And it was showing up in the strangest ways, like not scared of dying, don't need anything. And I'd go out for dinner and my friends would say, what do you want to eat? And I'd go, I don't mind. You know, nothing mattered. Like it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Yeah. You know, and they'd say, pick something. And so I'd get the menu and go that. And they go, seriously? Go, yeah. You know, order two of what you like. I'll eat what you don't, you know, like that sort of thing. And so I was incredibly easy with everything which drove some people mental as you imagine you know like make a decision please and probably the other thing is that time means absolutely still does means absolutely nothing to me at all i i lost my ability to manage time in any real way in the surgery i wasn't great at it before but it's pretty much gone now but i do think a lot of that i can't blame the brain surgery brain surgery for that i think it's just seeing the illusion of time for what it was you know did that but that has been challenging for my time attached friends. <laughs> you find um, that you have a generally like broader uh, sense of the universe now that since you've had your near death experience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, look, absolutely. You know, 
my friends to it. We've had some times here, and I, ha- I look. What, one of the things I've had to learn to do is to be a little more sensitive about other people suffering. Because my wife did ask me, she said, "Do you think you've lost compassion?" And I said, "No, I have more now. Mm-hmm. I just don't carry it anymore as a burden." In that moment, I have more compassion, but once I've moved away from that moment, that compassion is now for the next thing, you know, and it's not a burden in any way. It's actually a, I, I don't know how to explain it, but so I've, I've, ha- I've had to learn to watch myself around people because people will say, oh, you know, I'm having trouble paying for my, you know, I've got to buy a new car. And I go, do you know that at the moment this unit, sorry, this galaxy is in the process of merging with another galaxy? This will happen over billions of years, and out of that probably three stars will collide. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, I and one of my, all my friends now, they're all over it because they go, I go, we're bags of bacteria living on a thin skin of slime on a lump of rock next to a nuclear reactor in space. I think we're all right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's definitely expanded. You know, I don't, I don't definitely don't worry about small stuff. And I've gone from being consciousness narrowed into Mark Waller with all of the constraints and things to do and all of that sort of stuff that Mark Waller had into being much, much, much more conscious of the fact that this is a miracle. The fact that we are sitting here breathing air, we've we've got bags inside our bodies that suck air in and put oxygen in our blood and then pump the bad stuff out. I mean, it's ludicrously, ridiculously beautiful. Yeah. And we forget it so easily. So, yeah, I kind of feel like definitely my consciousness has shifted away from Tiny Mark. Yeah. <laughs> And aside from like your heightened awareness and heightened uh, intuition, have you ever had any other visions or flashbacks or anything with, you know, in relation to your NDE? Flashbacks. I have had moments because I never meditated before, but since the surgery I've been meditating and I have moments. So there's two things about that. I, I heard Alan Watts talking about something, I think, and he was talking about someone was leaving an ashram and the guru gave someone some advice. And he said, what's the, I said, I want some advice so that I can stay in this heightened state of awareness. And the guru said, attention. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, attention, that's my advice. And he goes, oh, I want more than that. And he said, attention, attention. And he goes, That's great. Like, I need more than that. And he said, attention, attention, attention. And so for me now, I'm very, very aware that the quality of my life and the quality of my experience is a direct result of where I direct my attention. And if I'm directing my attention back at endlessness, then everything changes. And so... I just had a flashback (laughs) and I've had several in this conversation, you know, and they stopped me in my tracks, but I still yell at people on roundabouts. So, (laughs) but our soul does record every millisecond, everything we do and experience as a collective. Right. Well, see, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. See, Tim, it feels to me very much that, Our identity is a construct, but a construct is still energy. And energy must exist some way in somewhere in the universe. So there must be a record of that. I was talking to someone about that once and was saying, well, you know, once we're dead, do we just merge into this big one thing? I don't really want to do that. I, I like quite like me. I don't want to dissolve into nothingness. Mm-hmm. I said, well, does a computer lose any of its individuality when you hook it up to the internet. And it's c- kind of the same. I think it's just that we our, we create an identity, we get pushed out of another human being, make up an identity, and then that becomes the filter through which we experience life in the universe. And it taints the way we see the life, life in the universe. And if we're ever able to put that aside, we're actually able to see the universe clearly and that we are 
we are in fact consciousness. And so I don't, I don't know with my limited human brain, I don't understand how the idea of an, a separate soul can fit into that. But, you know, that's because I'm still a human trying to work it out as a human. But I do believe that um, we do have like a higher self, a higher consciousness, and, and that we're just fragments of it. And, mm, yes. and at the end of the day, we are all still pieces of source. So we're yes. all pieces yeah. of God. And, yeah. and I think it's just his funny way of experiencing so many things simultaneously, you know. So it's almost as though, for me, to relate to higher self, to relate to the world as higher self means to lose the ability of physicality in a way. Like I know that when I, when I have those moments, I can barely speak because I have no way of articulating what's going on and the feeling is so overpowering that I have no very little capability of actually speaking. It's a it's an energetic thing. It's not a it's not something that can be, you know, oh I said it right at the beginning. It's not something I can articulate because it's just so outside the 3D experience, you know. I cannot be the same human being that I, I was, you know, and not long after the surgery, I came back and everyone was sort of not quite sure what to say to me. It's almost though as though in dropping all of your boundary, uh, sorry, barriers and surrendering completely to what is, the noise of the mind stops and there is a greater access to connection and a greater access to expansion. Mm. Exactly. I used to read Krishnamurti a lot. In oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I used to, you know, like that feeling and, and when you get emotional, I used to get that reading his stuff, you know. Yes. And he talked a lot about love and connections and many other things. But I, I remember, like, think on these things. I don't know if you ever read that by Krishnamurti. I'm, I'm tearing up now thinking about it, you know. I can see that. It was, Wow. That's yeah. love shining through, man. Mark, I cannot tell you how much of a pleasure it has been speaking with yeah, you. Yeah, me too. Thank you so very much, man, for sharing all this with us. I, really I'll have it. to come to New York and meet you sometime. I've loved this very much. That would be. I'm actually in Montreal. I keep seeing New York time because oh, I just figured nobody knows who, where Montreal <laughs> I know where Montreal is. <laughs> Take it easy, man. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye.